morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Please stand. Let's worship the Lord. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, oh, you are my portion, you are my
to share with you this morning uh, Isaiah 40, 26 through 31. And it reads, Look up into the heavens who created all the stars. He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you see God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord, they will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will, knock, they will walk and not faint. Man, Isaiah the prophet, in verses 26 through 28, he's saying how limitless, how powerful, how sovereign is the creator of the universe, our God. But then in verse 29 through 31, he's saying that sovereign God wants to help us out, wants to walk hand in hand with us and renew us and give us his strength so we don't have to rely on our own anymore. I shared this this morning because verses 29 through 31 uh, were our theme verse for this women's conference the past two days. And, and that was so beautiful to see how God would teach us and renew us and, and teach us the life that he wants us to live walking with him. But at the same time, I wanted to remind you guys in this room uh, that whatever you're going through, God is so sovereign and he has authority over it. He's not threatened by your doubts. He's not threatened by your season or your situation. So would you trust in him this morning? Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, I praise you so much for another day. I praise you for every person who is in this building. I pray that you would work in our hearts and have your way today. Uh, we invite your Holy Spirit into this room. We praise you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand and worship this morning?
has been awesome, and our ladies that got to experience that uh, awesome weekend at our women's conference, online there was over 700 each time, and so just amazing uh, the way that God uses media and everything else to uh, get the word, his word out there to us, that we would grow and become more like him. We're on this uh, new series that uh, be the one, right? God has called us to be the one. I, I think about this canoe uh, video and how that is real for everyday life. Like we just don't want to bother people, right? Uh, we we you know we could see that they're getting ready to go over a waterfall, and and but we don't want to wake them up. Uh, we we don't, we don't want to bother them. Well, really, the truth is, I think it's because we're a little afraid, right? Like I I also get afraid. Every time, and I don't know why it is that I am afraid when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus, and, and, uh, but, but I, I, I'm afraid. And so I thought about that a lot in the last few weeks, and I thought, you know, why is it that we are afraid? And I think because most of us have a fear of rejection, don't we? That we're afraid somebody's not going to like us. Maybe they won't want to be around us anymore. It reminds me when I used to sell life insurance. Yeah, I used to, okay? You all can still answer the phone. All my friends, when they found out I was selling life insurance, they quit answering their phones. I mean, ghosted me, man. I, 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 it didn't matter how I tried to reach out. I wouldn't get them to answer the phone because they knew I was calling to tell them what they really needed. And they thought, I don't know if I really need that, right? But that's how we think it is with God, with the good news of Jesus. But the good news about Jesus is it don't cost you anything. His gift is free. The truth is we all have a need for a Savior. We're all sinners, but saved by God's grace, His love, His encouragement to us. Will you be the one? The answer is yes. We talked about last week. The time is now. We don't have to wait for a better time. Uh, next week, the results are eternal. And the next week, the reward satisfying. The time is 
is now. Main, our, our main text here this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 1 through 21, and then we're going to jump into just the first two verses of chapter 6. And so I want to read those to you if you're following along with me there. You can watch on the screen or open your Bible. And here's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. And I think it's important that we realize that, he, that he's saying this to the church. In other words, the church, people that believe in Jesus, people that believe in God, people that love him, he is addressing them in this context. And I think he's addressing you and me this morning because we have this same fear. But he's saying, don't be afraid. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, he's talking about our body, if we die, that we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Everybody look at the person next to you and say, heaven. It's real, folks. Amen. He is really pointing this out to us. Don't be afraid, right? Well, it's easier said than done because I don't know about you, but I'm not, I'm not in a hurry to die this earthly death. I, I know uh, because of faith, faith is being sure of what I hope for and certain of what I don't, do not see. I, I have faith in a place called heaven, eternal life. I am certain of it, but I haven't seen it yet. Somebody say amen. I, I really feel in my heart that he's wanting them to see there's something greater, though we all say it, do you believe it? He goes on to say, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, longing to live forever is what he's saying, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose, the one who created us, this is God, who has given us the spirit as the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Last week I talked about, that's why I'm so big. If you unzip me, you find Jesus on the inside. He lives inside of us. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, when we surrender our life to him, God places his spirit in us as a deposit. No wonder when we do something we're not supposed to do, we feel bad. No wonder whenever we are going down the road and mom told me, actually mom didn't tell me last night, but my nephew Alex stayed the night with grandma last night and he blurts out when they get to the house, we, we took a hitchhiker home last night. I'm like, what? There's a, a inside us a burning, right? That when God leads us to do something, even if it doesn't seem right to us and the rest of the world, we just do it, right mom? She's back there on the back row. I'm not scolding her because I know her heart's tender. She's not going to let somebody walk. You guys, now listen, if you run out of gas, you just pray Mary Thomas drives by. <laughs> she will pick you up. <laughs> I love you, mama. That's where I get that heart. People say, man, you got a tender heart, Russ. I know I get it from my mama. Therefore, we are always confident, and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please Him, to please God, whether we are at home in the body or whether we're away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. <clears throat> Since then, verse 11, we know what it is to fear the Lord, and we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we're out of our mind, it's... Some say it is for God. If we're in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love, his, his love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here 
And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then in chapter 6, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. And now is the day of of salvation. The big idea this morning is do not miss the opportunity today. Will you be the one? We all woke up this morning with an opportunity. We have this opportunity to carry the message of reconciliation, to carry the ministry of reconciliation, to be Jesus' ambassadors for him. The very first thing you've got here on your listening guide is eternity is a big deal. That's what Paul was saying in his scripture to the church here this morning. This is a big deal. There's really nothing bigger on the planet than this. That's how he starts it out there in verses 1. For we know that if this early tent we just, is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal household in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. For while we're in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Therefore, verse 6, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please God, whether in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all give an account for what we've done in the body, whether good or bad. And then he says in verse 11, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. I missed this tag right here on Wednesday night, as Wednesday night's our first service for each uh, of the series. And so I got to preach this Wednesday night, and I missed this little piece. It's a big piece. When we think about the kind of big deal this is, that he's saying this is the most important thing, church, that we as believers can talk to anyone about. I remember my dad talking about in the 70s, the, the, the uh, uh, fire and brimstone preachers. You know, they would say, get right or get left. <laughs> they would say, turn or burn, baby. Uh, you know, there was this just in your face kind of preaching, and people would say, well, man, I didn't like that kind of preaching. It was like they were trying to scare people into heaven. And I tell people, if we're not scared of hell, something's wrong with us, right? Hell is a very real place. There's this, we are eternal beings. We will live forever. That's when he said, I'm creating man in my own image, God said in Genesis, he was creating us to be eternal beings. We will live forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 11 says it this way. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. And some translations say that he has written eternity on the human heart. Of course we want to live forever. Man, I don't, I'm not, you know, I was telling Angie the other day, I'm going to be 48 in September. Some of you are like, you're just a whippersnapper. And some of you are like, man, you're old. I kind of line right there in the middle right now. Mortality is becoming one of those things. I remember when I turned 33, Jesus died when he was 33, his his, his earthly walk, right? And and so at 33, it hit me. I was like, oh, man, I'm getting old. I'm old as Jesus was when he died. Now 50's coming up, and I'm like, where did my life go? Like, I'm closer to that end now for sure than what I was 20 years ago. Wait till 60. I know. I was asking Jeff the other day. He's 10 years older than me. And I go, I was having this conversation with him too. I mean, I've been talking about it a lot. And I was like, dude, you're old. He said, oh, I don't feel any different. He said eternity in our heart. We want to live 
forever. It is the big deal. There is no greater question that we can ever answer than in your opinion, what do you understand it takes for someone to go to heaven, for someone to have eternal life, for someone to live forever? What would it take? And man, I'm going to tell you, I get all kinds of answers today when I talk to people. People will tell me, well, Rusty, I think you got to be pretty good. You got to be a good person. Well, Rusty, I think that you need to obey the Ten Commandments. That's what you need to do. Rusty, I I think that that you go to church on a regular basis. That's what you do. Rusty, I think you put money in the offering plate. That's what you do. Those are all good answers, but they're not the right answer. Because the Bible teaches us that nothing we can do gets us to heaven, but it's what he did that provides the way. Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7, in him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. It says in another place, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the good news. That's the good news. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, It is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. At least no one should boast, right? The reality is that I can't do anything. It's what he's doing. I love Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 as it goes on and gives us a little more insight there when he says that he who begins a good work in you, that salvation is faithful and just to complete it until he comes. Heaven is real, but hell is real as well. Matthew chapter 25, 36 says this, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Matthew 18, 8 says, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. If it is better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. In other words, boy, you know, whenever it talks about the word death, you know, the separation, that's, that's separation from God for eternity. We think of death in our context because we go to funerals or things and we see, uh, you know, a, a coffin and we see uh, the flowers and we see all those things and it's just kind of, we don't have that relationship because we can't talk to that person anymore. And so for us, it's just kind of a final event. It's done. But the word death in the Bible doesn't mean death like that. It means separation from God for eternity. It doesn't mean you cease to exist. You will either exist in a place called heaven or a place called hell. And that's a reality. And so what Paul is trying to say to the church is that we don't have, there there is no room for just thinking that I'm okay. Just because somebody go to church don't make them a Christian. Just like me sitting in my garage in a, in a chair doesn't make me a car. Same thing, folks. Uh, I can say I want to be a great singer, but I'm not a great singer. Just because I say it don't mean it's the way it is. It's, it's not a uh, talk it into existence kind of thing. You either are or you aren't. And somebody says to me, Rusty, how do I know? How do I know? Man, aren't you glad for God's word that it tells us? Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. That's it. You know, in the Baptist church, I grew up in the Baptist church and we would have a prayer that we would lead somebody through. We called it the salvation prayer. And I think that it's still important that we pray and we nail down a time when we ask Christ to forgive us of our sins and we ask him to be the boss of our life and we say we believe you are who you say you are. It's important. That's, that's what his scripture is telling us. I have lots of folks from lots of different denominations that come here and so I've learned lots about other denominations and some of those denominations have what they call um, uh, confirmation class. And for some people they think, well, I'm okay because I went through confirmation class. And then there's people that come and they say, Rusty, I was baptized as a baby. I'm okay. Folks, let me tell you something. Salvation isn't a religious act. It is a, it's a relationship. It's a saying, Jesus, I choose to follow you with everything. With everything. 
That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. I love it. He's saying confess. Fess up. Say what you did. First John chapter 1, verse 9 gives us more good news. He says that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Old Testament says, uh, though your sins be red as scarlet, that everybody can see them, I shall wash them white as snow. I will wipe them out. They will be no more. Eternity is a big deal. Eternity is a big deal. If you're sitting right now, maybe you would pray a prayer like this. Because I don't believe any certain prayer saves anybody. But we know what he said in here to make him the Lord of our life. That means he's the boss. I'm going to live for him, no longer for me. And to believe that he is God. So you might pray something like this in your mind right now. Dear Jesus, if you want to give your life to Christ, you might say, Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I ask you to be the Lord, the boss of my life. I surrender my life to you today. Lord, I want to live for you the rest of my life. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. In a little while, in just a few minutes, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to the Lord today. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's word, not by Rusty's word. You all with me? If you trusted Christ and you're a, you're a new creation, that's what he goes on to tell us right there. The second thing is, intentionally, I believe this, God is calling us to be the one. That's your next two blanks. I don't think it's any accident that you showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning at Life Point Church or you're watching us online right now here at Life Point. I, I believe that this was all on purpose. That it's intentional that God has called you not only to be his follower, but also that you would share his love with the world around you. For He goes on to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 through 15, look at this. For Christ's love, it compels us, it propels us, it moves us forward. There's a reason we do what we do and why we do it. Because we are convinced that one died, that was Jesus. And therefore, all of us died. We, we turned from our sinful way. We died from our sin. It's separating us from sin. Uh, we, because one has died for us, all have died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here, and all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, not counting uh, or sorry, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us that message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you. Here he is again. It's a big deal. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I love uh, the premise. I love the conclusion. I, I uh, went to school. I didn't know much. Uh, when I went back to seminary, it was funny. People said, boy, Russ, when you go to school, don't let them change you. And, and I would say that I think I affected the seminary more than they did me because the hillbilly came to seminary. And I, uh, there's a whole lot of words they use I don't get. But one of the things they taught me, and I was not good at English, uh, you know, so whenever we started talking about a participle and a noun and a pronoun, and all, I, didn't, I had to go back to school, basically, and Google that thing just to figure it out. But that when you have a logical conclusion, there are what they call premises. And he's saying, if and then. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there's the premise, here's the conclusion, the new creation has come. In that moment, even a few minutes ago, if you prayed and you asked Christ to come into your heart and life, everybody blink your eyes. That's how fast. That's how fast that your eternity 
is secure in Jesus. You say, Rusty, I'm a mess. I know, but you're now God's mess. And he's going to clean you up. The good news is greater is he that's in you now than he that's in the world. And he's going to do a work in you. But now he's given you a purpose. That, that's the logical conclusion. If anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. God's given you purpose. He's given you intentionality. The Bible says right here in 2 Corinthians that he gave you a ministry of reconciliation. He's given you also a message. You know what to say of reconciliation. And he's made you, he's gave you a position as an ambassador of Christ. Isn't that awesome? If you're like me, you probably look up to God occasionally and go, do you know what you're doing? You sure you want me to go tell them what you want me to tell them? Like you think I'm the example that needs to be... Will you be the one in your home, at work, at school, at the lake, on the ball team? Here's the third thing. Now is the right time. Now is the right time. I, I've had those times when I'm talking, and I'll actually have this conversation. I remember it wasn't too long ago. I had a guy sitting in my office, and he was having this conversation back and forth with me about things. And I could tell by his that he really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He was religious. He had a lot of right answers, but he didn't have the answer that the scripture is telling us we must have. And th that answer is that he made a, there was a moment in his life, what I was looking for, did he have a moment that he said yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior? Was there a moment in his life that he recognized that he too was a sinner and needed Jesus? Is there a moment in his life that he realized that Jesus really is God. So I was having a conversation in my mind with, with God at the same time this guy's talking. He's talking. He could have been saying anything. It was like Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. Was all I was hearing because I was talking to God going, you sure right now is the right time? You want me to bring that up right now? Like, shouldn't I get to know him a little better first, Lord? And I'm trying to make excuses why. Remember back to the fear of rejection that he's going to reject me? Because that's my pride inside of me. Now is the right time. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2 says, As God's co-worker, we urge you. Do you see the urge, the urgency? We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you in the day of salvation. I helped you. One day this is going to happen. He's saying, today is that day. You ever talk to somebody and they go, yeah, down the road in a few more weeks, in a few more months, maybe a few more years, this thing's going to happen? God's saying, now's the day. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. Today is that day. Matthew 9, 37 to 38, Jesus is walking with his disciples. He looks out across the fields, across the see cities, across there. He's looking out over the countryside. And I love how he relates to the folks, whether they're fishermen or whether they're farmers. But in that day, he looked across the field and he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. I love this. He's saying we don't have to sow the seed. We don't have to water it. We don't have to cultivate. We don't have to do any of those things. What he's saying is the harvest is plentiful. I was out in the, uh, uh, the fruits coming in on my fruit trees. And we have RJ off over the hedge that lives behind our house. The raccoon. Pretty sure it's the same one. Because I was pulling in there the other night, and as my lights flashed across in front of that tree, RJ was like hanging from the tree like this, froze. And he didn't think I could see him. He was out there collecting my fruit. It's getting close to the harvest. He was going ahead and getting ahead of it, uh, helping himself out. I don't know where he's taking the stuff. We don't even have to water anything. All we got to do is he says, pray you the Lord of the harvest that he will send out laborers. Why? To gather it. Just go pick it up. Just go invite. 
That's what I love about LifePoint. You guys already have a culture of invite. You love your church. You want to invite people. I tell people, listen, if you're going to go try out a church, go try out the other ones first. This place is addicting. You'll want to come back. We, we're just so excited about what God's doing in our midst, and so we want to invite all we want to invite. That's gathering. That's going and gathering people up. We know that people are going to hear the gospel, the word of God, when they come to church with us. Amen? We take them to small group Bible study because why? Because the gospel is presented at small group again because we know that the gospel is what's going to change our friend and our family's lives. We go to work and we share about Jesus and what God did in our life today. That's gathering up the harvest. That's saying that, man, uh, I was a wreck and God saw me through. He made a way when there seemed to be no way. It's simple. You were created for this. Doesn't it make sense now? You were created for this. Who do you need to have the eternal conversation with today? I left you a place underneath your next step there where you can list three names or so. Maybe you know five or six or eight or ten. Who would you have the eternal conversation with today? Get with that person and tell them Jesus' story of love and forgiveness. Begin by simply inviting them to church or to Bible study with you this week. Let me pray for you. God, I love you. And God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for those that prayed just a few minutes ago to ask Jesus to ask you to be the Lord of their life. Who ask you to forgive them of their sins. And who in just the last few minutes... The Holy Spirit come in and dwelled in them. God, I pray today that they wouldn't be ashamed of that decision. But God, they would take one of us by the hand this morning that are praying with them and just let it be known publicly that yes, I gave my life to Jesus. Let us celebrate with them today. God, for that person that's here that needs to rededicate their life, God, I pray today that they would just let go of the things they've been holding on to in order to take hold of you. God, today I pray that you would be with each person that's got a medical thing and maybe they're struggling with finances or maybe their marriage is tumbling out of control. God, be with that person that's dealing with depression or anxiety. God, I pray that you just let them feel your peace and your purpose in their life today. God, help us use the story of how you see us through that we could be a witness for you and tell others that the same Jesus that sees us through can see them through. Lord, we love you and we thank you for asking us to be the one. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me right now? We're up here ready to pray with you. If you have a need, you come. We want to pray with you. If you've given your life to Christ today, if you prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you and come into your heart, you come right now, friend. We want to celebrate with you. Come on, friend. You are not hidden There's never been a moment You were forgotten You are not hopeless Though you've been broken Your innocence stolen I hear you whisper Underneath your breath I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue. There is no distance that cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be a shelter. I'll be your armor. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. I will 
to receive Christ today. I don't want you to leave without us having a chance to visit and get together. I have a gift for you today. God's Word. I got a Bible. If you'll come see me, I want to make sure you get that. It's the most important tool you'll ever walk with you in your life. That's how we get our guidance. And so we love you. We don't want to embarrass you. We just want you to follow Jesus with everything you got. Come see me today before you leave if you gave your life to Christ today. Share with them a little bit of good news. Y'all can be seated. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Rusty. We're going to take an offering at this time. So great to see each and every one of you out this morning. It's kind of rainy, but it's a great day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, just so thankful for the blessings that you've given us, Lord. Multiply this offering for your use and your service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you didn't pick up a listening guide, make sure you grab one on the way out. There's lots of things in that. Small groups starting back up in uh, September. Rusty was talking about that. Uh, Sunday mornings at 7. If you're bored and want something to do, we do have a contingent of people that are going over to Fulton to the campus over there. So if you'd like to be a part of that next week, we'd love to have you get on the bus. Let's pack the bus and send it over there. But uh, Jeff is over there this morning with them, so helping them start their worship up. But uh, I think we've got a, a video from Savannah and... Uh, have a great day. Good morning, church. We're so glad that you made it today. I have a fun announcement. Uh, we're actually starting up a teacher supplies box. It'll be located near the entrance. And this is going to be a great opportunity for us to give back to the teachers in our community. We're going to need all kinds of supplies that teachers would need. You name it. We're going to need Germex, wipes, anything for a whiteboard, pens, papers, pencils, just anything that a teacher would need, we encourage you to bring in. And you have two weeks to do this, so don't wait too long. I hope you guys have an amazing week, and we'll see you again next Sunday.